Hey everybody, welcome back to Low Friction Friday. Hope your week has been as low friction as possible. And let's make sure that your upcoming weekend is the same. Right now, um, there may be a little bit of background noise you can hear. Uh, for some reason, my um, laptop's running a little weird. So it's uh, the fan is going full speed. Um, I've done a reset and it's come back on. So it's uh, it's thinking about something really hard, uh, potentially today's topic. It is uh, possibly very curious about how to get the most out of ultrasonic cleaning and whether it is viable for itself. Uh, and it's just so excited about that, that the CPU is just stuck on 100% and the fan is going uh, going full speed. So apologies if there is background noise whilst I'm recording here. I'll be moving over uh, a bunch to um, record uh, at the ultrasonics with a portable camera. I, I haven't used that for this yet, so I have no idea how that will uh, turn out, um, but we will see. But that'll at least take us away from the fan noise. All right, let's uh, just give a bit of an intro for today's topic. Okay, so yeah, ultrasonic cleaning. I've done a video on this in the past. Uh, it was still pretty clunky. Um, as you know, any topic of any sort of uh, depth, I can quite easily get lost in the weeds as we cover all the ins and outs of what you may or may not wish to use it for and, and how viable it may be for you. Uh, today, I'll cover a little bit of that, but not too much. Um, it's going to be mostly focusing on how to ensure that if you have one or are definitely planning to get one, how you should, I guess, get the most out of it and you can check that you're getting the most out of it. Especially for some applications, um, there's potentially times where you know going through all the extra time in FAF really may not be worth it and, uh, and I guess a, a way to check on if that's the case for you. And some of the information that I'll be putting out will differ to information you may have seen on other channels. Some other channels where normally that channel and zero friction cycling, are, um, you know, that we're pretty aligned with the information that we give out. Uh, however, some of my advice will differ uh, if you've seen those. So that, that'll be come apparent um, through this video if you've seen certain channels, videos on ultrasonic uh, cleaning and waxing as opposed to what you may see and hear from me today. But uh, let's get into it and see yeah, what, uh, what help I may bring to you or not. Okay, before we rip into the main topic though, let's just run through some uh, low friction news updates. Um, all right, I have uh, pretty much uh, wrapping up um, testing on two machines, which is going to give me a chance to uh, try to whip the candle wax test back on a machine so I'd started that, I had to pull it because some of the other testing was quite urgent. Um, looks like I've got a bit of a break, hopefully, in between some more uh, product being sent to me for testing. So I'm going to try to rip through that and, uh, and I'll update uh, as best I can um, on, on the videos, I guess, how that is going and then obviously with an overall wrap. So, um, yeah, I know some are very interested in that. It will be a bit interesting. I'm going to pre-put a caveat, though, just so that it's sort of not a guess a caveat let down perhaps at the time of, of reviewing the results just please take note that candle waxes are so enormously variant because it can be you know really it's just, they are just sort of such a who knows wax base that can have so many impurities uh, in there from palm oil to soy different grades in terms of how hard and soft they are you know so how gunky they may or may not be as well so we will get a test, um, but just pre-warning that the results that I'm going to get here for candle wax, user experiences, if you are for some reason using candle wax as your waxing, they will for sure vary because your candle wax will not be the same as my candle wax. And it's just going to be, you know, all over the place. And I, I certainly am not going to be testing 50 different uh, candle waxes. I can only recommend, so one of the other tests we'll be trying to get to as well will be for the um, uh, proper food grade uh, wax. So uh, golf canning wax is typically the one we would recommend to those that are doing or going down the DIY wax path. If you're going to DIY wax, the message has always been if you use a good uh, wax base that's a, it's a highly refined paraffin, whether you do or don't, do not add some additives to it. As long as the base is good, you're going to have overall a very good experience and you're likely to beat a lot of, you know, 
on the on the shelf products that are out there in the bicycle chain lubricant space so you know whilst it's not going to match the top stuff it's still going to give you overall a really good experience however if you're buying cheap crap uh, stuff then your experience can be you know maybe it it is okay maybe it's going to be you know one of those experiences that can overall give immersive waxing a really bad name uh you know it can be the experience where your drivetrain just gets so gunked up from this crap wax that bike store mechanics when you bring it in just shake their heads and can think that this whole immersive wax caper is crap so you know and your cycling friends so um you know if that's what's happening with your immersive wax don't use that just go to a if you if you really want to do the DIY uh, DIY wax, which can be a great option, just go to a good base. Uh, is is always been the message, and it comes up a little bit about you know additives and so on. You can play around with that uh, if you like, um, but we're trying to recommend to people to stay away from adding PTFE. Really, the industry as a whole, or at least all the good players in the industry have moved away from PTFE in their products um, and are using other friction modifiers, typically uh, things like tungsten disulfide. Um, you know, as we know, PTFE is really not environmentally great, nor is it, you know, it's really bad with its production especially. So there's been a trend away and there are some DIY wax uh, videos out there, you know, that their blend is like 50 grams and that's just bonkers. Now, even the original blend of UFO um, wax that was created from the Friction Facts uh, days, that had five grams. So some of these numbers being pulled out for additives are literally people are pulling them out of their ass just to cover that base safely. They have no idea as to what amount is actually effective or, you know, and above what that, what would then just be a waste. So just, yeah, a little bit of DIY wax cover uh, in the update there as well for you, but um yeah, please take note of some of that and uh, yeah I will be back as uh, as we get this test underway going to be a pretty busy boy in the um, I guess the little spot that we've got hopefully in between some um, some tests I need to get some uh, single application longevity tests done for lubricants that it really should have been done but I didn't have a, a time previously such as smooth um, Silk's SS drip I didn't get a chance to do it at the time I did the main test for that uh, I should redo squirt because that was only done under the old SAL protocol I had and I've got the newer, better one now so I need to update a bunch of lubricants onto that. A uh, bunch I can't recall off the top of my head now as well but I'll be trying to get um, some lubricants that are worthy of having the SAL testing done in case people really need to know you know, what their life uh, span you know, may be and if that's going to suit their riding or suit their event. So I'll be ripping into that. I need to um, wear durability test some of the new chains that have come out, such as the T-Type, so I've got to try to get onto that. Um, I do have them on the chain efficiency and longevity uh, chart. However, the uh, wear rating that we've given them, we've given them a very high wear rating, that is basically estimated um, simply based on the fact that they are using SRAM's hard chrome treatment on the higher level uh, T-Types. And we do know, I guess, from control testing previously and uh, just the, the years of knowledge on them that the SRAM's hard chrome is an extremely wear resistant uh, treatment so chains with that on them do have a very very long wear life uh, but I really do want to actually just get a, you know a control test done on at least one t-type with that just to verify. Uh, on the plans as well has been uh, doing some um, testing of I guess the different types of maintenance that one may do especially if it's on their uh, you know sort of wet lube drivetrain so we'll have a control chain obviously as always and we'll have a control wet lube and testing the difference between what happens if we uh, just keep reapplying the lube and wiping the chain versus if we do some periodic maintenance uh, using a spray degreaser periodic maintenance with a clip-on chain cleaner removing the chain to do some uh, container flush cleans and removing the chain to do some ultrasonic cleaning and seeing you know which of each method adds how much to the you know the wear life of the chain so that's been on the the i guess the want to do list for a long time and i'm really going to try to find a spot to try to get that done i think that will be quite interesting just to see the you know how much difference the various levels make uh, been requests a bit for testing uh, Silker's new chain stripper versus say U UFO drivetrain clean uh, there may be one or two others I might sort of put into that mix 
a number of places have been testing uh, the new chain stripper and so on. And generally speaking, like they've, uh, I think, been able to assess that relatively well. Uh, I would just like to, you know, obviously test in a way that gives us something really tangible and objective. So again, I would like to um, you know, do a control. So same chains, control prep with uh, normal solvent uh, cleans that we do uh, versus using stripper versus ceramic speed versus a couple of others. And doing an actual test, say control chain, control uh, wax, running those chains for, you know, X intervals on the test machines and being able to assess for the same chain and same wax, when do we get the jump in wear rate, which will denote when that wax treatment is done. And that will give us an indication as to how well that wax treatment bonded to the chain after prep with that particular product. I think we're going to get something much more tangible uh, by doing that as to how well these cleaners work um, and you know, matching their, their hopefully their, their claims. But again, that just takes test machine time and, and my time to get to um there's another test i won't bother running through that so but yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff obviously that we've got on the fun to do list and i'll be trying to get into as much of that as i can and update um before uh, machines get a bit tied up with with some book tests again i'm going to try to push book tests or uh, if i can not take new bookings for a little bit to try to get some of this other work done that's been getting more and more overdue so fingers crossed on that Alrighty. Okay, ultrasonic cleaning, uh, something I have uh, delved into the past. Today is going to be a little bit of a different focus though. So, but let's quickly cover off. Uh, do you need one? No. For 99% uh, plus of people, no. Now, my focus is obviously on chains. Uh, if you're looking at it for parts cleaning because you like to remove your cassette and um, you know, have that coming out looking all sparkly or various other parts, that's a, a, going to be a, a different focus to today. Today I am focused on chains and you know prepping chains for um, either top lubricants or your periodic maintenance of chains. So, in short, uh, you know you can do, especially for training chains, a perfectly perfectly good prep, especially off bike in containers or either either on bike as well these days with the uh, new fang dangle uh, chain prep. Uh, stuff that's out there such as uh, ceramic speeds drive train clean and silk is stripper um, you do not need in any way an ultrasonic cleaner to prep your chain for either waxing wax drip lube top uh, wet drip lube um, the use case for some for prep um, would typically be an avid racer who wants to go more down the path of a fully optimized prep where they are looking to initially give their chain um, an initial break-in run with the factory grease that will bring in some level of contamination not much of it's done indoors but a little bit more outdoors because factory grease is not amazing for resisting uh, contamination and to a degree there's not a lot of um, you know I guess you know you may not get the best benefit out of that break-in as part of your optimization unless you can perfectly clean the chain uh, and if you've got contamination that's been brought in an ultrasonic is going to help ensure that there is nothing left in any tiny nooks and cr you know, crannies and fissures inside the chain uh, done properly the ultrasonic is going to get that chain basically perfect so that is really you know i typically do not recommend for people to do a break-in if they're looking to prep a race chain unless they have an ultrasonic cleaner because it may to a degree negate it again less so if you're doing it indoors on an ergo there's not too much risk there but you know it is um just part of i guess general practice that if you're going to go to that extent if you're trying to extract every fraction of a watt out of your chain to make it a dedicated race chain and you want to do that at home then uh you know this is really where having an ultrasonic is is probably going to be something you might want to think about so there's that, and then there's just, I guess, those that wish to do the best periodic maintenance for their chain, um, you know, sort of, especially if they're on uh, wet lubes, but also certain wax lubes, uh, you know, riding in harsher conditions sometimes, and they want to get the chain back to perfect after it has been exposed to a whole bunch of uh, crappy contamination in there. Then an ultrasonic, again, it can do better than what you can achieve with uh, just container method off bike. Um, but sometimes there are a few things to be aware of with trying to actually get that to happen. Um, it is not always you bung 
something into your ultrasonic, bung the chain in, press go, and uh, it, it's just all magic. A lot of channels do kind of show that but it's not always the uh, the case. And so today we'll cover off how to make sure that magic does always happen, um, even though it will take a little bit more uh, faff on your part, but it's not much and you're going to get the best out of your ultrasonic. Okay, let's cover off point one, size. Size, as the old saying goes, can matter. Um, I've seen a bit where people tend towards the larger uh, based on uh, the fact that they may wish to be doing some fun stuff with their chains and they may wish to be doing uh, some fun stuff with their parts like such as their cassettes and they may have some fairly large cassettes if they've got um, you know some mountain bike cassettes so now a larger one is for sure going to help if you're cleaning uh, other bits such as cassettes and chain rings again just in terms of I guess my focus which is mostly chains larger can be a bit of a pain in the butt the reason why this is so is that if you're going big uh, such as like if you've got a six liter or a ten liter typically uh, you know and, and you've got one or two chains that you wish to uh, prep or do some maintenance on typically you are then going to be putting your chain into a container and you're going to have i guess the bulk of the volume in the tank taken up by water and then you have the chain in something in a container. Now that can go okay, and we're going to demonstrate some of this later. But it may also drastically reduce the power of the cleaning uh, inside your container. So things to be aware of is that, you know, especially if the viscosity of what you are using to clean the chain is quite different to what is in the main tank, uh, the cavitation from the ultrasonic and, and really the way you know very briefly ultrasonics uh, their cleaning action or scrubbing action is by billions of imploding bubbles caused by cavitation sort of propagating uh, waves through the fluid that is going to happen in the higher viscosity uh, liquid so if you've got something like water in the main tank and then something that is of a heavier viscosity uh, as your cleaning agent that really most of the cavitation is going to occur in the uh, the higher viscosity liquid so you're going to reduce the power uh, of you know the ultrasonic cavitation in what is i guess going to try to clean your chain and this is going to be especially so uh, you know if you put it in a plastic container that's going to dull that quite a bit more uh, as opposed to glass or metal and again people tend to gravitate towards plastic because that is easier uh, and it's going to be, a, we'll talk a little bit more uh, a bit later about uh, whether or not you people are going to wish to use their ultrasonic for a wax application as well. Um, you know, the wax is already going to be quite a low viscosity um, for an ultrasonic. And typically power into the wax is going to be very limited. And it's going to be very, very much more so if that wax is in a container surrounded by water. So something like so for for chains typically um, something like a two liter ultrasonics are a bit funny in their sizing quite often if it's two liter that seems to be the external volume and the internal volume will be like a liter so i have uh, a bunch of uh, two liter ultrasonics and the internal volume is one liter uh, so they're not two liter inside so it's quite weird um, but something that is basically say most two liter ultrasonics which will be uh, one liter internal volume um, you can fit sort of typically four chains in in these they're, they're brilliant uh, and they do one chain and two chains uh, really well and the advantage is that you really you're just able to put the uh, the actual cleaning solvent or solution directly into the uh, the tank and then the chains into that so uh, yeah that, that's a real advantage to having the smaller size but obviously then that will negate you getting a uh, 52 tooth or a 50 tooth cassette in there or your chain rings however for chains uh, for both cleaning and other things then uh, yeah that size is great all right all right next fun subject let's quickly talk about uh, ultrasonic power okay so you will typically want so this is just a very general benchmark but a great benchmark 
sort of spot to be is somewhere in the say 30 to 50 watt per litre power range. That will do a great job uh, with regards to cleaning power on your chain and or other components. Uh, you know, like all things, there can be, you know, the right tool, size tool for the job. So um, watchmakers typically don't have great use for a sledgehammer unless the repair's gone really sideways. And, you know, construction workers typically won't have a lot of use for a watchmaker's hammer. So it can be a bit like that here as well. You know, some units will be, you know, quite underpowered and you know, they'll kind of get there, but wow, can take some, some rounds. And others can be, you know, so powerful such that they can actually damage the chain. So it's more so um, for cyclists that are using their industrial ultrasonic at work. Um, we, we have been advised, uh, some people have emailed in over the years to say, oh, I tried my uh, super ultrasonic at work and it actually, you know, pitted the, the chain metal. That would be too powerful. So things just to take note of with regards to the claims um, is that sometimes, and you may or may not believe this, but sometimes claimed power and actual power may not be the same. So I have seen, now I haven't spent much of my life uh, trying to check out budget ultrasonic cleaners because I'm not in the business of uh, trying to sell budget ultrasonic cleaners. Um, but I have seen a couple over the years um, that uh, customers have had, and I had bought a cheap one many years ago when I started out just for fun. Uh, I had one where the claim power was 100 watts and its actual power was 20. It's a bit of a gap. What they can do is sometimes they will deliberately conflate the total power, if it's, especially if it has, say, a heating element. So it may claim it's 100 watts, but it's actually 100 watts if you have the heating on. So 80 watts of its uh, power consumption is going into the heating element and it has 20 watts for the actual ultrasonic cleaning. And that is not that uncommon. So you'll see you know, 200, 250 watts, but um, if, if that is including the heating element, you really don't have much of an idea as to what uh, you're actually left with in terms of ultrasonic power, unless you put a power consumption meter on it. Uh, which is what I did with mine and uh, another cheap one that a, that a customer had back uh, going back a bit. Um, and also take into account, I guess, what we're looking at is power per liter. So if a, you know, and, and this, this brand, I just, I guess, dive on in terms of budget ones. From what I've seen, the this Vivor brand for budget cleaners seem to be pretty good. Uh, I've been hammering one just for fun uh, in general stuff for a while and it's still going uh, its heating element works still works and its claim power matches pretty much precisely uh, what the actual measured power is when i'm just running the ultrasonic so that's a pretty good thing for uh, a cheap ultrasonic and look there may be stacks out there uh, i would feel pretty certain that the exact same internals and transducers on this brand are dressed up under other brands so there's could well be a whole bunch of cheap ultrasonics out there that are you know going just as well as as the vivor brand i just i don't know what they are all i all i can say is that uh for a cheap brand uh if i had to recommend a cheap brand the vivor one uh is is the one i guess i have uh tested and i'm you know really happy that for the price that's that's you know sort of pretty bang on so but just take into account i guess power per liter so this particular brand although they claim the tank size is 1.8 to 2 uh, yep, you actually can basically put one liter in there and you get your 60 watts of cleaning power in one liter of volume. So that's that's really solid. There's a bunch of ultrasonics, so especially as you go to some of the larger ones, um, you know, if they're claiming, you know, if this actually had, if you can actually put 9.3 liters in, not sure, I haven't tested the bigger ones, and the ultrasonic power is 240 watts, whip out my calculator, divided by 9.3, then you're looking at 38 watts per liter, and that will still be perfectly groovy. Um, you know those those numbers being uh, equal. See, you you can see a stack though where uh, you look at a 10 liter ultrasonic, and it claims 150 watts cleaning power. Uh, even if it delivers that, then it's um, you know only 15 watts per liter, and that's getting pretty much on the low side. Uh, so, you know, and especially if you may be reducing that power again by having different sort of i guess fluid viscosities between your container of cleaning fluid and water that's surrounding it in the tank 
uh, and especially if you're looking at doing anything waxing wise you you don't want to be further reducing um, you know the power if it's already at that lowish end because again you know stuff will happen eventually but boy it can take some time um, and it, it really just may be a lot of faff for completely bugger all benefit over what you might have been able to do in five minutes in a container all right let's talk about i guess because we're going to be demonstrating some of this what is degassing do you need to degas uh, and what does that do for you so this will read funny because i was going to do a little bit of a presentation and then i decided i'm not going to actually get time <laughs> to finish typing it so i'm going to run through where we're at so basically as i mentioned before ultrasonics pretty much work by billions of imploding bubbles all throughout the solution um, when you pour your solvent or a solution in a lot of air is going to be dissolved into that uh, same as a bubbler in a fish tank to oxygenate the water for the fishies to breathe if you've got air in your solution then this basically fills the imploding bubbles you don't get an implosion no implosion no cleaning action degassing is just simply running the ultrasonic um, so it may either be just on full or some have a, a degas function which actually helps it uh, degas faster than just running it on full without anything in the ultrasonic so no basket no parts uh, and what that does is it just enables the the ultrasonic to get that you know gas out of your solution and that's going to give it much greater cavitation you'll see on a lot of channels where they will just pour some stuff into their ultrasonic pop the chain in uh, in a basket and hit go and you magically see all the stuff you know vibrating off or, or, or you know, coming off the chain you know yes that will happen and yes if you don't degas it will get there uh, it can just take a really long time so um, this is something that, I, that again we'll demonstrate uh, shortly you could get you know I guess a sort of double triple the actual ultrasonic so your proper ultrasonic cleaning power after you have um, completed a 10 minute degas run as opposed to if you put something in there and run it for 30 minutes uh, it's like yeah, it will it will creep up there but for a lot of that time it's just going to be nowhere near as effective as if you had done the degas run now there are times I know that yeah, especially when I used to uh, do a lot of the workshop work and I was cleaning up a drivetrain ready for a, a bike to be switched over to waxing the first thing I would do um, is pop the cassette off pop that in the ultrasonic press go I'm not faffing with degassing uh, and it can just work away for 30 minutes while I'm working on other stuff so you know there are times when for sure you don't have to worry about it but there are times when you just you know you want your full ultrasonic power um, degas at first is going to give you that a little bit more while we're here info so the cavitation process so that is really what the magic of the ultrasonic is doing so it's ultrasonically induced compression waves that tear the liquid apart leaving behind many millions of microscopic voids partial vacuum bubbles which is called the cavitation these bubbles voids um, in the microsecond time scale grow until they become unstable collapse and release enormous energy temperatures and pressures on the order of 5000 k and 135 mpa are achieved that's in a sort of a bit of a higher end ultrasonic but uh, you know where this is the kind of stuff that we're doing in our ultrasonic for our cleaning that's a little bit of how they work and why they will get into the tiny nooks and cr uh, crannies and fissures inside your chain that container cleaning will not all right the last important component um, before we get to demo land is to talk about temperature so there are a ton of now this can be a rabbit hole there are a stack of uh, different ultrasonic cleaning solutions uh, if you want to get super into what you're cleaning there are solutions specific to say corrosion PCB there are some that are um, you know made specifically to work on waxes just general and so on um, pretty much all of your specific ultrasonic cleaners are aqueous so you dilute them in water now in terms of what we're talking about before with cavitation most ultrasonic cleaning solutions and in fact really most of your um, what you're going to put into your ultrasonic it is going to achieve better cavitation and power at a higher temperature so 
most times, uh, so best ultrasonic performance is roughly 65% of the boiling point of the fluid in use, and temperatures above that, um, it can decrease the scrubbing force, but it will improve distribution. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So most ultrasonic cleaners utilize temperatures between about 130 and 180 Fahrenheit. It's about 54 to 80 degrees Celsius. So again, depending on what you are doing, so if it is cleaning off factory grease with uh, traditional solvent like mineral terps, you don't need to heat it at all. Um, the actual cavitation is going to heat up that mineral terps uh, quite a bit across the, the cleaning anyway. And there's only so much, uh, I guess, vapors you want to get from really heating up your solvent. Uh, the, high, the hotter it gets, the more vapors you're going to have coming out of your ultrasonic. And so if you're using traditional solvents in an ultrasonic, which officially is not recommended, you know, just take care, re what you're doing for ventilation and potential you know sort of flash fire risk because you've got flammable vapors and unshielded electronics i haven't ever heard of anyone burning their house down um, using uh, solvents and their ultrasonic i'm sure somewhere in the world someone's managed to do something exciting um, so just make sure you are yeah taking all suitable precautions if you're, I guess, really looking to this though, and uh, you know, moving away from solvents uh, to other products, be it specific ultrasonic cleaners, or for you know what we're probably going to be more focused on in our land, something like say UFO Clean or Stripper, some temperature is definitely going to be, you know, advantageous. Uh, so, and this can again, it can help in such cases, especially when we're dealing with waxes and wax chains to have an ultrasonic uh, that has a temperature or a heating element function. Not, it's not crucial, um, but it can certainly help achieve what we want to achieve. All right, we've given an overview covering, you know, really the size that you should consider, the power, degassing and cavitation and temperature. Putting all of that together, you will kind of want to know if what you're using and how you're using it is actually working. And that's what we're going to be giving you some demonstrations of um, uh, after this uh, little bit. Uh, whilst I'm just the computer, so here's just something off, off the uh, good old web. You can find a whole bunch of stuff uh, yourself on both just general Googling and YouTube about how to check if what you're doing is actually working. So it's basically just called the foil test, so ultrasonic foil test. You're taking some strips of uh, aluminium foil, just get the cheap stuff uh, from your supermarket, cut it into strips or squares. And what you should see is significant damage uh, to the strip. So generally it will be uh, placed inside and run for a minute. And in a minute you should see some significant damage. I think they may have run this one a little bit longer based on that. <clears throat> Uh, you can note here, so typically the ultrasonics that we will be buying are normally 37 to 40 kilohertz. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I haven't covered. I'll ramble on a bit when I'm demonstrating the testing with regards to sort of pulse and sweep wave and all that sort of stuff. Typically, you're not going to need to worry about any of that kind of thing. Um, again, especially if you're looking more at the your budget brand, that's just not something that sort of comes into the picture. What you really just want to know and what you want to be able to do at home is assess that what you are using as a cleaning solution and how you are using it uh, and that your ultrasonic itself is actually doing something. Because if it's not doing anything, such as the picture here on the left, why are you going through all that extra sort of time and faff uh, for basically uh, your part to be vibrated very gently? you want the actual ultrasonic cavitation uh, for your that's why you bought an ultrasonic so from here we're going to skip over we're going to be uh, showing the difference between uh, different solutions and products uh, in some ultrasonics and with or without degassing and also we'll be able to actually just sort of show you live really what that difference is um, because at the end of the day, uh, you want to be able to, I guess, take that away and then apply, do that test yourself. And you may make some modifications. You may go from, wow, I was putting it in this uh, container surrounded by water and using X, and that's doing nothing. What if I do something different? What if I use a metal container or a barbecue tray? Will that work? Um, what if I am able to actually 
uh, put the entire thing in the same solution or solutions that are extremely close viscosity so that uh, there's not that big loss of cavitation power things like that so that's really what we want to get to so that if you are going to go down this path it's actually worthwhile and that you can prove to yourself that what you're doing is working Okay, welcome to the intergalactic headquarters of uh, ultrasonic cleaning here at uh, ZFC. Uh, we're going to go through, I guess, a bunch of demonstrations. So some of this stuff I'm going to uh, try to put the uh, camera on time lapse um, because it'll be pretty boring just watching a, an ultrasonic run uh, as we do the test strips. <clears throat> However, just we'll just get set up. So basically what we're going to be doing is we'll be testing uh, a few different things. I'll see how much time I've got this afternoon before I better start uploading. Um, we'll get as many sort of fun tests as we can to demonstrate what things work and how well they work. Uh, just going through all the iterations that I was talking about before so that you know how to get the most out of your ultrasonic, uh, hopefully, and also what you're planning to use and how you're planning to do it. What we want to do is we're going to make some test strips. Now, If you, this is just some um, cheap aluminium foil cut into a strip, high-tech stuff. If you put this in your ultrasonic and just try to hold it in there, the, the bottom will just curl up from the, the ultrasonic um, happening. So you need to either use something, you can use something to hold it down in the ultrasonic and or you can add a little bit of weight to the bottom of your strip, which is what we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit of both just to make sure it's going down there. So here is test strip number one, and we are going to do a test just with mineral turpentine, which is what we normally use for our chain prep, without it being degassed. We'll see the damage on the strip, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to give the ultrasonic and terps a degas run, and then we'll repeat the same test, and we'll be able to have a look at the difference. All right, uh, we'll put a, together a, a pick at the end, but uh, we can see basically no damage to the uh, to the strip foil there. So it's uh, survived a minute in a de very decent quality. So the ultrasonic there, the GT Sonic, it's a professional uh, or sort of entry level professional uh, quality ultrasonic, about $500 for the uh, two liter size, which has got one liter internal, 50 watts um, ultrasonic power on full. And that has done pretty much nada in the one minute that was in there. Let's degas it and see if we get uh, something different. Okay, there'll be a bit of background noise. We've got the terps degassing um, so that I'm not here uh, till midnight uh, and then try to upload. Let's uh, get the other one going at the same time. We're going to do um, UFO clean straight into the ultrasonic. No degassing. And let's see what happens with that one. Do, 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 do. Okay, let me move that to time lapse. Okay, not sure how that shows up on vid, but um, there's quite some significant surface, uh, so I guess pitting uh, from the UFO clean. And again, it's without any degassing or temp, so that's a really good sign uh, just straight off the bat. Um, if it's not clear on the video, it'll, it'll show up on the photo that we take to uh, put on the, uh, the edit later. All right, the uh, mineral turpentine ultrasonic uh, that has had a 10 minute degas run. This ultrasonic has a degas function. Let's run it in there. Let's see how it goes. Okay, yeah, so quite a decent difference. Um, versus the no degas. So again, this will show up nicely when we uh, put those together on the photo. But the uh, the degas run made a pretty big difference even with terps, which you wouldn't expect absorbs a lot of gas. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, the UFO Clean will be finishing its degas run shortly. So I will get that one happening next. All right, so this one here, yeah, we can see that it's um, eaten th a hole through the foil and where we're using the paper clip for the weight down the bottom, it's eaten right through that. So um, that's gonna be fairly stark. At the end of wrap, 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, summary, UFO clean is very effective in an ultrasonic. So uh, some things work uh, a lot better or they're more uh, suitable for, I guess, cavitation. Um, TERPS is obviously at the, quite at the low end. Uh, UFO clean is uh, doing very nicely. Um, since we've got something actually demonstrable with the UFO drivetrain clean, I'm going to now uh, see if we get much of a difference if I'm putting the drivetrain clean into a, um, I guess a fairly typical sort of plastic container that one might use if they're trying to put their solvent or cleaner in a container inside a larger ultrasonic. So I'll surround this with uh, what people would normally do, which is water. Uh, I'll give it a, a decent chance. I'll actually, um, I'll heat the water up to a good 70 degrees so that the water is, is nice and warm. Uh, with the previous uh, one that I just demonstrated, so that's at the, the ultrasonic has got the UFO clean up to 29 degrees. Uh, its effectiveness would continue to increase the warmer that became. So I'm um, not sure if there's a no-go temperature for UFO drivetrain clean. I might um, check with them with regards to that, but quite safely you would be able to do that at you know sort of 40 to 50 degrees Celsius and its effectiveness in an ultrasonic in terms of the cavitation power is just going to increase as that goes up. So anyway, let's, uh, let's see how, what happens when we uh, put the uh, UFO clean into a plastic container surrounded by water. Uh, the UFO clean has been degassed. I'm going to just carefully uh, decant uh, or put some scoop into the container. It's not going to aerate it. Uh, we will then, I'm going to put the water in. Uh, I'm going to run the water. I'm going to degas that uh, water uh, surrounding the UFO clean so that there's effective cavitation within the water because the air has been removed. So we're going to give it the best chance that it can to perform well within a plastic container. And let's see if there's much of a drop in effectiveness versus what we uh, saw just a moment ago. All right, uh, there is very, very little uh, action happening on that. So uh, definitely less in the container with everything degassed and at 60 degrees, which is a really good temp for ultrasonic uh, cavitation normally. Uh, it, that is clearly less than just UFO clean straight in without uh, any degassing. So the putting it into a plastic container pretty much killed any ultrasonic uh, action happening in the UFO clean. And so, yeah, as I sort of mentioned in the, in the main section of the video before this, that, that that's a real issue with um, going to the larger size ultrasonics and surrounding your uh, cleaning solution uh, with water, uh, and especially if that is in a plastic container. It's going to really, really dent uh, the ultrasonic power. And especially as we've seen with TERP, so um, obviously we could you know, test for days, but a lot of your, I guess, more traditional solvents, they're not really designed for, uh, I guess, ultrasonic cleaning or cavitation. Typically, your sort of more aqueous-based products um, you know, will do a lot better. So uh, there's already pretty low ultrasonic power you know, directly in those solvents. Um, if you start putting the solvents so, you know, in a container surrounded by water, you're taking a pretty low ultrasonic action down to a really, really low point. And it'd be definitely, if you've been doing that, it'd be worth doing a test to see if you actually have any ultrasonic scrubbing happening, or if there's just some lovely vibration uh, that is making things maybe look like something's happening to a degree, but it's just really, it's just easy surface level stuff coming off. The scrubbing that you want deep into the nooks and crannies and fissures, if there's nothing happening on your strip, I'd be very, very skeptical that something is happening to get any contamination out of those particular parts of your chain. Okay, we'll stick with um, uh, this particular run uh, just for differences at the moment. What happens if we put it into a container that is much more likely to transmit the ultrasonic cavitation? Um, so to give it the best chance. Now, it, it's, it may still struggle. I haven't actually done this uh, particular test before. And the reason it may still struggle is because of the viscosity difference between the UFO drivetrain clean, which is a, a much lower viscosity than the water, which is surrounding it. And that's really going to impact uh, things. So, but we'll see what if we swap out the plastic container for something that would transmit the waves a lot better. And that would be, so either you can use either a glass. Now, if you're gonna use glass, generally you're looking at a Pyrex, uh, otherwise it may shatter, uh, especially if you've got a decent power going on. 
or uh, you know, metal containers in a nice convenient thing can actually be sort of hard to find. Uh, little aluminium barbecue trays, you can pretty much bend that uh, into a nice container to fit into a range of stuff. Uh, and if what you've got is too small uh, for your big ultrasonic, buy a bigger tray, easy as. Let's swap the UFO clean into this and uh, let's give it a whirl then and see how things go. Having said that with the aluminium barbecue tray, I'm just giving a quick uh, re, uh, de gas run because it did get a bit of air in pouring into that. Um, <laughs> and, sorry, just still thinking on it. Take caution with that because uh, the um, little barbecue tray is pretty thin and being aluminium, your, your ultrasonic will actually eat through that pretty quick. So it's not going to be your uh, go-to um, solution, sorry. Brain fade on a Friday afternoon. You will need to uh, look at a proper glass or a proper metal um, container because yeah, your uh, handy aluminium tray, it may be all right for a, um, uh, a run or two, um, but <laughs> you may find that your cleaning solution is part of your uh, water carrier solution uh, after not too long, if you've got some good cavitation going on. All right, good burpy Fridays. Let's see what happens shortly. All right, a very small amount of uh, uh, damage has taken place. Um, so I guess <clears throat> good news is if you have a um, large ultrasonic and you do need to surround your uh, container of uh, UFO clean, um, you know, and it's, you're using a metal or it'll likely be the same result if you had a Pyrex glass, something will happen as opposed to nothing, uh, which is what we saw with the plastic. However, it's, it's not a lot. So it's, it's going to be some pretty long run times to uh to really get things going so as the part really the size matters for chains it sure is a whole lot easier if you have the size that you can put your uh, ufo clean or similar directly into the tank degas it because it was really you know a powerful effect uh, in drivetrain clean when we did that <clears throat> uh, all right let's move on to the next fun one Right, so while we're on the professional uh, cleaning stuff, let's have a look at, uh, I'll put some um, Silka chain stripper into the other ultrasonic and I'll get that degassing. What I'm doing at the moment, still on UFO clean, is I have uh, poured UFO clean into the ultrasonic to surround the metal container so that we have UFO clean, the metal container and UFO clean so we don't have the different viscosities of the uh, water um, in the tank going then to UFO clean which is going to really mess anything up or potentially sort of messing up that whole cavitation uh, that we want to get through the fluid. Let's see what difference we see if we have the UFO clean and the container and that. And so we'll do that test in a mini. Let me get uh, stripper degassing and we'll see if stripper uh, shows up similarly to UFO clean. Really how well it uh, gets some ultrasonic cavitation going direct in tank. Okay, let's move on to those. All right, so yeah, meh, the, that didn't help either. So um, aside from eliminating the, uh, the different viscosities with using UFO in the tank, I uh, redid the test using uh, glass because uh, yeah, it seems like, and this is fun while we test, even the quite thin, uh, you know, sort of metal container with the uh, just the little barbecue tray that's pretty much blocked everything very little action uh, got through there still so uh, if I said barbecue trays may be an idea before scratch that they do not work do not uh, bother all right let's get uh, two more done um, let's do the UFO clean again uh, this time in a glass beaker surrounded by UFO clean and I'll move straight on because we'll be finished degassing uh, to testing uh, Silka's chain stripper direct in the tank. Let's see what we get. Okay, the, uh, so the UFO clean in a glass uh, beaker surrounded by UFO clean in the tank. Uh, moderate. We, we've got a little bit of, uh, yeah, I'm going to give it a 5 out of 10 bit of action happening. So. The glass beaker does okay, but uh, there's still a fairly noticeable reduction in the power as opposed to having it directly in the tank. 
So it, it will do okay. You just expect to at least double the, uh, the length of runtime or clean time that you would want to do if you're using a container. Uh, stripper, direct in the tank. Yeah, really, really effective. We can see that's eaten out a, a pretty massive uh, section there and, and pretty notable damage. So um, I would say that that's even, you know, done, done a good bit more damage than the UFO clean direct in tank. One of time this afternoon, running out of battery on cameras and all that as well, to re-go through all the rigmarole of uh, doing the same battery of tests with strippers, what we've just been doing with, uh, with the UFO drivetrain clean. We could probably be pretty safe to say that all the same stuff applies. Um, so, you know, putting in a metal container doesn't work. Uh, surrounding by water is going to um, likely detract a lot. And putting it in any sort of container as opposed to direct in tank uh, is going to have a reduction, even if it is in a nice glass beaker. All right, so the last test I'm going to do just with this, just with UFO clean whilst we're on a roll with that, is I'm going to do the UFO clean in the beaker, but surrounded by water and degas, because that's, again, that's going to be the most likely scenario people are going to have if they're using a, a container as opposed to surrounding it with clean, and we'll be able to compare all those at the end. So let's see how that one goes. Uh, whilst I'm doing that, I'm, uh, I'm currently degassing uh, the bigger one with an actual um, ultrasonic solution. And so this is the one that, that we do use for, uh, for the waxing and also for the race chain uh, preps because they have a break in. So we really want to make sure that we're getting in deep. Uh, so we'll have a bit of a look at um, what we see with, uh, with a much more professional grade ultrasonic. So this one's uh, typically around $1,600 as opposed to the $500 uh, uh, GT Sonics. Uh, this does have pulse and sweep waves, so it kicks in a bit more uh, with that as well. So we'll have a look at, uh, at that one uh, once we've completed just this one final uh, UFO drivetrain clean test. Uh, it actually wasn't too bad. Um, yeah, a little bit better than I uh, expected. Could be that the, the water's actually um, up to pretty good temp and the UFO clean's up to pretty good temp, uh, so it may have helped aid it, but uh, not a bad uh, bit of action happening with UFO clean uh, surrounded by water in a glass beaker. So if you are looking to use that, you've got a larger size um, and you, you do wish to uh, use a product that's going to be pretty effective, uh, then the UFO clean uh, surrounded by water, as long as it's in a glass uh, beaker, that, uh, that went reasonably well. So we'll see that uh, again when we get all the photos or close-ups done. <clears throat> But that's uh, something, and obviously uh, based on what we saw with uh, Stripper, uh, that's going to go, you know, at least as well. Last couple of uh, tests we're going to do, we're going to see what the, uh, the really high power one uh, does, and we're going to put uh, some wax already pre-melted. We'll put that into the uh, ultrasonic. We'll set the temp to 80, which is as high as it can go to try to maintain that temp. We'll degas it and we'll run it uh, for a minute in the wax, see what we get uh, with wax. I'm not expecting a lot of action is going to happen uh, with wax, so, but uh, we shall see. All right, uh, did three there. Let's have a look at the first one. So, uh, molten speed wax direct in the ultrasonic tank. Good news is, there's something happening. So it's actually, uh, as we'll see in the, in the sort of photos, uh, yeah, it's not nothing. So um, by degassing direct in tank, some cavitation is actually happening direct in the tank. So that's a good sign. If you were to put it in a container though, that relatively, or it's, it's sort of not a huge amount of action there, you're gonna be reducing that a lot. And you're probably not gonna get a lot out of that for the time and faff. In the more powerful ultrasonic with an actual ultrasonic cleaning solution. Damage is pretty uh, severe. I did it uh, just normal as well as uh, on the, the pulse wave. Pretty similar, but yeah, we can see that it's significantly eaten in from the edges as well as put holes uh, through. The paper clips came out both times, so uh, it's doing a fair bit there. So as expected, a more powerful ultrasonic is doing more, and especially when you've got, uh, I guess, a solution that is meant to be used in an ultrasonic uh, and maximize the cavitation action, <clears throat> that's what you're going to get. So you can get specific uh, solutions. There are tons of them. Uh, you can get them for jewelry, you can get them for oils um, and greases, you can get them for waxes. So if you're looking to do 
maintenance on a wet lubricant uh, in an ultrasonic or maintenance on a wax chain in an ultrasonic, then you can get an actual specific solution to get the best cavitation and the best cleaning power uh, in your tank. Uh, or as we've seen, obviously, uh, the products like UFO Clean and, uh, and Stripper looking pretty darn impressive uh, in the tanks. I don't know, I know that obviously ceramic speed, um, the UFO Dry Tread Clean is precisely what they use in their ultrasonics as part of the UFO chain prep. I'm not sure uh, at the time of uh, recording this on my Fading Friday uh, if Chain Stripper was you know, in any way designed for uh, or had in its brief use in an ultrasonic tank. Uh, but yeah, really impressive. So um, if it wasn't, good news is it's great. All right, uh, I'll take a couple of pics of all the uh, the strips, and then we'll head back to uh, the main computer, have a quick chat on those, and then wrap up. All righty, close up inspections. Here we go. So let's have a look at uh, the mineral turpentine. So direct in the ultrasonic, um, without degassing, we can see there is basically zero damage done. With degassing, we can see that there is some definite pitting taking place in the foil both around where the uh, paper clip is and on the edges so this is why um, for the general chain prep in total so most chains are going in for a total of two and a half hours of ultrasonic uh, time across uh, three terps baths and uh, two alcohol baths and you know compared to what we'll see with um, <clears throat> some you know other cleaners that actually sort of really work you know much more effectively in ultrasonics you know you'll be able to do a cleaning run really in one d gas and one 10 minute run so you know that's that's kind of the difference the reason why you know we're for the just your general prep we're using the uh, the terps is that we can recycle that so that um the prep can be done without it costing everybody an absolute fortune but just take note really for yourself that if you're using solvents at home in your ultrasonic uh, one, you really need to do that degas run, and two, you know it's going to be generally pretty low power, and that if you are then introducing, um, you know, a container and a carrier medium in between uh, what's happening here, that power is going to be reduced further. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I guess just be prepared that that really deep scrubbing action may not be taking place as well as you would hope by using uh, traditional solvents in your ultrasonic. So if you're going to do so, you're really looking at directing tank and degassing for sure. All right, moving on to the UFO clean. So no degas uh, straight in the tank. We can see that it's, you know, had a pretty good go at attacking the, the foil there. Post degas, there's a, a quite a, a notable difference. It's actually punctured through uh, the foil. So that's pretty groovy. Uh, once we have put the UFO clean into a plastic container surrounded by water, we can see that has drastically reduced the amount of, um, of cavitation. Uh, there's really very little uh, ultrasonic cleaning power getting through to the UFO clean um, if one does that. So uh, we'll continue on to the others and then do a bit of a wrap on that one, but there'll be some good takeaways from this. Okay, so... UFO clean degassed and in the metal container. <coughs> I apologize, that was a <laughs> fun segment. That's the fun of doing live testing. Um, I can't remember now where I was given the information that um, as long as it was glass or metal, it was fine. It was really plastic that dudded the, um, the transmission, the cavitation, the metal completely dudded that as well. So use of a barbecue tray or any metal container, that is going to really uh, stuff things up as well. So... Um, <coughs> That was a fun little uh, live learning that you can completely disregard any thoughts of uh, be it a barbecue tray or any other metal container. <clears throat> that was really not much different to plastic, so that is uh, is buggered. Uh, so same whether we had water in the uh, the tank as the um, the filler medium or UFO um, to continue the same viscosity through. When we uh, had the UFO clean then in a glass container in the uh, with UFO in the tank we can see you know really good amount of uh, of damage there uh, so notably higher action happening and similar uh, actually the water in the tank was actually uh, more impressive than I thought so the difference between uh, those two mediums was not as um, I guess uh, worrisome as, as what I thought it might be so that carried over really well uh, by this stage it could have been aided a little bit that by then the UFO clean and the water um, were at a really good temp. 
uh, so the water in the tank was sort of up to uh, it was over 60 degrees Celsius and the UFO clean was uh, was right up there as well so um, but e either way UFO clean is is quite effective and as long as you are if you're not having it direct in tank due to the size of your tank uh, you can use water uh, all pretty groovy just make sure that your water and UFO clean are up at a really nice temp I'd say at least 50 degrees Celsius uh, and you're going to get a pretty effective result there alrighty summary and conclusion uh, what to do with all that hour of power information okay so let's uh, try to wrap this up uh, in a way that this whole uh, fun time is actually helpful for you if you are going down this path or looking to go down this path <clears throat> so number one size personally um, much prefer to have a size such as the two liter such that you can put your cleaner direct into the tank it's going to be most especially if you are looking at using traditional solvents like turpentine or white spirits things like that uh, they do not uh, seem to have great uh, cavitation and scrubbing power naturally you're going to need to give them really long run time as well as the degassing to get a deep clean into that chain uh, you know expect that it's you're probably going to be wanting to run these things for you know well over an hour all up so it's going to be multiple times of uh, of getting the, the ultrasonic running for its max normally 30 minutes and so if you have a larger ultrasonic and you are using another medium and container in between that already very low uh, ultrasonic power uh, that you're getting in that in those um, in those solvents is going to drop to just super low it's just gonna be a lot of faff um, and a lot of time to try to get something happening um, so just really bear that into account uh, power obviously uh, so yeah, if you're planning to use just the solvents obviously you want something really powerful but I would recommend in general to be at least around the 50 watt per liter mark 30 watts really is going to probably be your absolute minimum to really make sure you're getting good ultrasonic power especially if you're thinking of using traditional solvents and especially if you are thinking of doing uh, waxing in your ultrasonic as well uh, we've hopefully demonstrated the importance of degassing. I only sort of really did the one degas versus uh, non degas, oh, sorry, two I think I did, uh, and there was a pretty clean or clear difference between the two. Um, you don't uh, have to, but it's going to drastically increase your run time uh, that you're going to need to do if you do not degas. So just bear in mind that. Temperature really helps. Um, so again, you don't have to have a temperature control ultrasonic, but for most ultrasonic solutions and cleaning, they will work much better at temperature, and that is more easily done if the ultrasonic has a temperature function. These solutions uh, and contents will heat up from the cavitation as you run it anyway, but again, you're just adding a lot of time until it will get into that really nice, uh, nice zone. If you are using uh, things such as a um, glass uh, beaker or glass container and having water as your surrounding medium, boil up the water. Um, you don't necessarily want it boiling water in there. Um, so but you, don't, you don't need to have a fancy kettle either that you can set to 70 degrees. Boil up a kettle, pour in say two thirds boiling water, put a third in tap water, degas uh, with your cleaning solution and beaker in there so do the degas run and then you're going to be sweet so things will be set up really nice your solution and uh, and carrier are all at a great temp that's going to help aid uh, the cavitation and ultrasonic power and yeah as mentioned a bit of a ramble at the end of the last little um, uh, segment uh, do some testing yourself so uh, you, you'll get a little bit of foil if things are going really well into the stuff if it's in your cleaning solution it's really not a big issue because you're using it for cleaning um, if you get a little bit of foil in your wax and it's just your training wax don't stress just test it make sure that it's actually working if you're planning to use uh, waxing as your path for say your dedicated race chains don't don't bother with waxing in an ultrasonic for uh, your training chains nobody really has uh, I've certainly not seen any data that ultrasonic waxing really gives us anything over and above just a good swishing in a pot um, maybe you know it's one of those things that there's a potential marginal gain there if you do ultrasonically wax very well 
um, but there's also the potential if you've got a really low power ultrasonic and you're putting your wax in a container in water in your ultrasonic uh, and you run it for a good long run because you you're degassing and then you're you're running the ultrasonic um, with your chain in there if the power is not there there is every chance that the friction modifiers that you want beautifully distributed through the wax will start to settle uh, more towards the bottom and you'll have a worse distribution of the friction modifiers through the wax than if you simply gave it a you know normal swishing in your wax pot so if you're going to go down the path just uh, yeah I guess take note of, of the things that we've covered today to make sure that you've got some good power and you can test that you've got some actual uh, action happening uh, in your ultrasonic with wax and if that's the case then that is cool to do for your uh, race chain but it's really not worth, uh, worth the faff at all for your training chain because whatever that marginal uh, or potential marginal gain may be you will never ever ever be able to track that benefit uh, in your training chain it is a marginal gain when you're going for every possible fraction of a watt uh, with your race chain so really keep it i guess as the as the sort of reserve for that um it's you you've got to be the most avid tinkerer ever to want to look at doing that for your training chains okay and to help wrap up sort of what you may decide to use when so as i covered in a previous video on the chain prep with that we do with zfc now the reason why i'm using the mineral turpentine uh and the methylated spirits even though uh, they've got really low uh, I guess cavitation effectiveness in the ultrasonics so how do we get really long runs we've got a batch process through so depending on the the chain brand they're spending anywhere really uh, between a total of two and a half hours in the ultrasonics to three and a half hours so um, as they're just sort of moving through it's not like I need to stand there and, and watch them and the uh, terps and methylated spirits I'm able to uh, use alcohol distillers to get most of that back which keeps the pre-prep cost of the chains you know basically at, at as far as i can tell by far the most competitive prices uh, of pre-prep chains out there in the entire globe apart from dodgy backyard jobs um for i guess your own prep you know where you're really only going to be needing to prep uh, chains quite infrequently if you're using a good lubricant product your chain shouldn't be uh, wearing out too quickly so the times that you do need to prep a new chain we can see that the uh, effectiveness of something like the ufo drivetrain clean either directing tank or as long as it is in a glass uh, beaker uh, and pleasingly as we saw that even when it was surrounded by water as opposed to ufo clean there wasn't actually that much difference there so as long as things are nicely up to temp and degassed and if it's in a glass um, container then uh, if you've got a large ultrasonic that's still really really effective and uh, Silka's stripper was really impressive uh, as well. So um, going that path is going to be great for a lot of you. It just makes it a whole lot easier. Um, so especially, <coughs> sorry, boy, dying. Uh, especially if you are looking to prep your own sort of race chain or you want to do the best prep uh, that you can and you have decided to do a, a chain break in, then, you know, that is a great uh you know ultrasonic clean that you're going to get you're going to get a really perfect clean uh, using those products if you're looking more at the maintenance side of things so be it you're running a wet lubricant or if you're running a wax lubricant so i guess for the maintenance side this is really where i would be considering um, you know using a more ultrasonic specific uh, cleaning solution you can buy them from you know various brands if you just google basically ultrasonic cleaning solutions you will find them uh, coming up uh, to buy from somewhere in your country the advantage of those is that obviously aside from the fact that they are designed to ensure they give you brilliant cavitation is that they're going to be overall a lot cheaper so you know unlike initial chain prep which is going to be pretty infrequent and products like the drivetrain clean and stripper are designed to soak up factory grease really well maintenance you know you're bringing contamination in uh, so you've now got a pretty expensive bottle of stuff you bring the contamination you know, into that product that you wanted to clean out you may be able to sort of you know do some uh, coffee filtered you know decanting and, and clean that up a bit uh, but again it's, it's kind of like all right if you're going to be doing some regular maintenance on your uh, uh, drip lubricant chains 
just getting that that concentrate because uh, you know a one liter bottle is going to last you a heck of a long time because you're going to put basically um, depending on your ultrasonic you know 500 ml uh, or a liter of uh, water into your cleaning container you're putting a very small amount of that uh, ultrasonic cleaning solution in and it's going to do a brilliant job once you've got to temp and degassed and yeehaw so um, again though with ultrasonics um, a key tip is so if it's um, you know, wet lubricants, do the bulk of the work still with container baths first. Um, you know, you, you can just, if you go through the faff of your degassing, um, getting all things ready and you pop your, you know, sort of really dirty chain in, your solution's going to get really dirty in about 10 seconds. And things don't happen as amazingly after that time if the cleaning solution is really dirty. Smash through some container bars first. I mean, you can pump a liter of solvent through, um, you know, within about three minutes or five minutes whilst you've got your ultrasonic degassing. Get the bulk of the crap out uh, via that method and then use your ultrasonic as the piece de resistance, and, you know, really enable that solution to get into all those tiny, you know, nooks and crannies and fissures where we really want to get uh, the contamination out to get that perfect clean, get it into places that container methods won't. That's really what you want it for. Similarly with wax, if using, you know, you're maintaining a wax chain, so most uh, solvents, and especially like terps and, uh, and you know, white spirits, things like that, they don't work amazing on waxes. Um, so do a boiling water you know, flush rinses first to melt off the bulk of the wax if you're maintaining wax strip lube chains. And then again, if, you've got a, if you're uh, using a wax specific uh, ultrasonic cleaner, it's just going to do a brilliant scrubbing action and get that wax chain back to perfectly clean. Uh, so, you know, for maintenance, this is where, um, depending on how often you're planning on doing it, a ultrasonic spe uh, specific cleaning solution, be it oils and greases for wet lubes or wax, if you're using wax drip lubes, that would probably be the path to go as opposed to uh, using something like um, UFO Dry Train Clean or Stripper, just simply due to cost over time. So, right, hopefully that makes mostly sense as a wrap um yeah this has all been pretty much mostly one take one and my computer's crashed twice so far uh, in this process and obviously just with the uh, little portable camera so <laughs> it didn't make me look very flattering um i swear i'm only 50 not 70. um but yeah we just need to try to smash through this afternoon and still hope that um yeah there's been a i guess deeper information and some better information um, you know within this one than what you've uh, may have seen on some other ultrasonic uh, cleaning videos and uh, a way for you to make sure that you're doing it um, in a way that is actually effective uh, any questions um, obviously please uh, pop them in the comments below and i'll do my best to uh, to get to those and aside from that yeah as always have a great low friction weekend and i will catch you on the next one which uh in theory should be the next detail review and hopefully after that i will have uh, a few ducks in a row to do a bit of a deep dive into non-round chain rings and a few fun things with regards to why they may or may not work all right till the next one bye